only one thing harder than to get up and preach a lesson after a meal like that. And that's for you to sit and listen to. <laughs> I know. I dread always. And I've been on numerous occasions a speaker after a meal, lunch or something, in a seminar or whatever, and I see the eyes of those who are watching me. They're going, I don't know if they're trying to look harder. <laughs> What's going on? But we will get through this. Good meal, by the way, for all those who had a part of taking a minute. There are two words that pique my interest, and I pray that they do yours. And these two words are something that we don't hear a lot of if you watch any kind of news or listen to the news or perhaps even read the newspaper. We just don't seem to get enough of it. And that's good news. Everything we hear about is usually not of that nature. It's not good news. And so what I want to do over the next few weeks perhaps is peruse the book of Mark and look at some good news. Because I'll guarantee you, the more, the more you read the newspaper, and of course all of us, some of us perhaps, uh, whether we watch the news or not, but you know there's world news, there's local news, there's the market news, there's political news, there's weather, there's sports. I mean, it's just on and on. Um, so you might be able to really tell what the bad news is, but I want you to go away from here today knowing the good news. And of course, that's the news about Jesus Christ. This man received a call from the doctor. The doctor said about this medical test, I did on you. I have some good news and some bad news. Well, the man said, well, what's the good news? The good news is that you have 24 hours to live. What's the bad news? I meant to call you yesterday. <laughs> Sometimes it might catch up with us. Mark chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, and I pray that you do, that you'd open up to this glorious gospel of Mark. Mark paints a beautiful portrait of Jesus Christ as not a king as Matthew would do. And Luke paints him as perhaps a... Uh, well, I was trying to think of the word, and I completely forgot it. But as you read the Gospels, each Gospel writer portrays Jesus as something different, different audience. Mark portrays Christ as a servant. And when you read the first verse of Mark chapter 1, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now we talked a little bit about the gospel this morning being the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. As we read about in 1 Corinthians 15 and other places that Paul would preach nothing more than Jesus Christ and him crucified. But this word gospel means something quite different. This word means good news. The good news of Jesus Christ the Son of God. Well, if it's good news, then what can we learn about it? What does Jesus do that brings across such good news to the people that he encountered? Jesus, according to Mark, and as we well know, as I already mentioned, was a servant. And Jesus, the Son of God, responded to the Father's will. And he did so by teaching and by healing. And of course, there's other ways that he did that. But those two are rather prominent as you read through the Gospels. The first thing I want us to look at is found in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. <coughs> 
And this story, as many of them are going to be, are very familiar to us. In Mark chapter 4, I believe, beginning at verse 35, we read this. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats also were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into that boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep, on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Then he arose, and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. And but he said to them, Why are you so fear fearful? Why is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the waves, the sea, obey him? You look at this first picture of Christ. And I don't believe it, it takes much for us to understand that Jesus calms the storms. Literally here in this scripture, but even more so in our own lives. He calms the storms in our lives. It was evening Jesus decided to go to the other side of the sea. This great storm came up while the disciples were there. The waves beat into that boat. The boat was about ready to sink. You ever feel like that? Have you ever been to the point where you felt your boat was about ready to sink because of the storms and the waves that have beat on you all day long or all week long? What would you do? If you were in the boat, <laughs> Jesus is sleeping. I could never do that. Or one, I couldn't be out in the sea. Oh, we were talking about fishing a little earlier. That's one place I don't need to go, or I'd be done for a month. Nice, calm little pond or a lake would be fine. <laughs> I would want to get ashore about as fast as I could, or I'd be scooping that water out perhaps faster than it was coming in. Praying, panicking, crying, worrying. That's what they were doing. But Jesus Daddy. was sleeping. Daddy. Why was he sleeping? Why do you sleep? Because you're tired. He had a long day. Yeah. They awoke him. And they asked that question. Do you not care? Don't you care that we're perishing? An amazing thing happened according to verse 39. He arose. And instead of rebuking the disciples immediately... He rebukes the wind, no. and it stops. No. Peace be still. What can we do when a storm hits us? Nothing? Watch. We have a lot of storm watches lately that we've probably seen or heard on our phones. Pray. When you see the response from the disciples, it's rather amazing. Who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey him? I'd say it can be nothing more or less than the creator himself, Jesus. So the good news is, from this perspective, if Jesus can calm the storms, in their fears, then why would he not be able to calm ours in our time? You know, we can stay glued to a TV weather station trying to find out what's coming our way. And that, that would be probably a good idea if they know what they're talking about. But when the storms of life hit us, who do we go to? Who do we talk to? How do we deal with the situation? If Jesus is the only one that can truly calm the storms of life, then we ought to be looking to him 
for help. Because he's the only one that can calm my fears and take care of that situation. I was told a long time ago, and I was reminded not too long ago, that no matter what happens in life, there's one constant. Jesus is Lord. And he always will be. No matter what's going on, he's Lord. So give it to him. Give him that storm. And let him say to you, peace. Be still. As we go on in chapter 5 of Mark, there's a couple different things going on here. The first 20 verses talk about the demon, the man who's possessed. They come to the other side of the sea and get out of the boat, and they meet a man on the shore. This man had come from the tombs where he'd been living. And as you keep reading through those first 20 verses, you find that this man had not only one unclean spirit, who Jesus dealt with from time to time, but this man had many. His name was Legion. And as you read down a little further, you see that he had enough unclean spirits in him to fill a herd of swine 2,000 in number. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot of unclean spirits. No one could help him. No one could control him. And he was miserable. He was totally miserable. And I wonder at times, you know, when I, when I talk with people and I try to empathize and try to find out what's going on, how would you feel if there was truly no one who could help you? And up to this point of this man's life, there was no one. No one. And when Jesus enters the picture, what does he do? The man runs up to him, and he worships him. That amazes me. Why this unclean man of 2,000 unclean spirits would run up to Jesus and worship him, and his words are, please don't torment me. Good Lord, he'd been tormented enough all his life. Did he really think that Jesus would do that? That he would torment him? In verse 5 of that chapter says, Always day and night he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and, and cutting himself. He ran to Jesus and worshipped him. Now you look at this situation and you say, If Jesus can rescue this man from his misery, and I surely can't come close to having that many unclean spirits in me, I don't think. What can he not do for others? What can he not do for you? He rescued this man when no one else could. And he can do the same for you. When you and I come to the point where we are that miserable, when no one can do anything for us, and we know it. there's only one to turn to, and that's Christ. That's good news. Because Jesus, we see, took care of that man and took care of that situation. So he goes back into town, fully clothed of his right mind. Can you imagine the crowd? Kind of like the woman at the well when he, when he transformed her life. There's another one that we could look at. She goes back into the town. And they all come out because of what Jesus Christ had done for her. Also, as we continue into that chapter, verses 24 through 34 of chapter 5, there's a couple different scenarios here. Jesus had crossed over again by the boat to the other side, and a great multitude gathered to him, and he was at the sea, verse 21. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. It's amazing what people do at the feet of Christ, knowing what he can do. And he begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, 
and she'll live. So Jesus went with him, and a great number followed him and thronged him. You would think we'd read the rest of the story right there. But on the way, Jesus encounters the woman with the flow of blood for 12 years. <clears throat> Verse 26. It suffered many things from many physicians. I'm so glad we don't have to go through that today. She had spent all that she had, and I'm sure glad we don't have to go through that today. And was no better, but grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. What faith this woman had. <clears throat> Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. She fell on her, she fell on her body that she, might, that she was healed by the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in, my, in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? He looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. This woman had suffered at the hands of many doctors. She had basically ruled out any more resources that she had to take care of this problem. She spent all that she had, but the situation grew worse. You know, as we look at all the diseases that are out there before us, and there are quite a few of them that are not, where there's no cure for them, we see how desperate people are. And we also see, unfortunately, many others who take advantage of those people who are desperate. But when Jesus came, she wouldn't even speak to him, but believed in him. And she believed in him so much that she thought, if only I just touch his clothes. And what happened after that, again, was amazing. Immediately, her affliction is gone. See, if Jesus can rescue this woman from her desperation, why would we not think that he cannot rescue ours, rescue us from ours? When we're that desperate that we have nowhere else to go, and we've used up every resource possible, we probably wasted a lot of time, a lot of money. And Jesus was the one that we should have gone to in the first place. He can help. What about Jairus' daughter? What happened? <laughs> Verses 21 through 24, of course, tell us the beginning of the story. As Paul Harvey would say, let's look at the rest of the story. Verse 35. And while he was still speaking, some came from the rule of the synagogue, Jairus' house, who said, your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher anymore? It's over. Gone. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Don't be afraid, just believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John. There's the inner circle, the brother of James. And then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. Did you ever hear anybody wail? Truly, well, I've only heard that once. And I pray I never have to hear it again. A woman that lost her husband years and years ago who thought that he was going to live. And when the doctors finally told her what, it, what was going on, I never heard such a wailing in my life. 
It goes right through you. So imagine that type. It's not just a whimpering or a weeping. It's a wailing. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child's not dead, but just sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. And he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha, or Talitha Kumai, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately, the girl rose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they, were, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it. And he said that something should be given for her to eat. If you are a parent, I know most of you are, what would you do, what would you be willing to do to save your child's life? No. Would you have the faith that Jerry's had? Knowing that perhaps even if Jesus had to come, all he had to do was speak the words and she'd be healed. Would you beg someone to help you to save your child? Would you kneel like Jerry's did and so many others that came before Christ? Then just when you thought someone could help you receive news, that it's too late. That your child has passed away. If Jesus can rescue and raise a girl from the dead, surely he can raise us when we die. Now, of course, that's both physically and spiritually. We're going to be raised. Raised from the grave, a new body, a new creature. Of course, like we are in baptism, but a little different next time. An eternal body. Really, what we're talking more about there is when you're dead in your sins, who else can help? Who else can rescue? Who else can raise you from the dead, so to speak? Jesus. Can you imagine being thronged by the crowds because of what you can do. I don't know if more people came to Christ because of that reason. I'm sure most didn't come because of what, what he was teaching because of what they heard what he could do. <coughs> and they came for that reason. You're sitting here this afternoon re-encountering those lessons that we've looked at. Looking at the good news of what Jesus can do in a person's life. <coughs> what you've got to do now is make that very personal. And it might hurt. You might not like it. See, when we look into the Word of God, it's kind of like a mirror <coughs> in a sense. You know, when you look in the mirror in the morning, I don't like doing that because I've cracked a few, but when you look in the mirror in the morning, you get a reflection of what you look like. But when you look in the Word of God, you get a reflection of what He sees, what truly is in there, what He wants you to be in life. Not what you want to look like or resemble, but what He wants you to look like. And if he can do all these things and so much more as we look over the next few weeks, you've got to know that he can do it in your life. That he will rescue you from anything. It's any storm that's coming your way. He'll do it. But you've got to go to him to find that peace. If he can raise Jarius' daughter, and of course, he's not the only one. She's not the only one. Lazarus was another one that he raised. You see, Jairus' daughter, I'm sure, as well as Lazarus and any others that he raised, all had one thing in common. They all died. Sooner or later, they all died. There's only one who has the power to overcome death, and that's Christ. 
as we learned this morning in our lesson. So what can we do for you? What can the Lord do for you? What can your brothers and sisters today do for you? If you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never been washed in the watery grave of baptism, to have your sins washed away, you can do that. Jesus will rescue you from that. If there are sins in your life that you need to take care of this morning or this afternoon, Jesus can rescue you from that. If you need to rededicate your life to the cause of Christ, perhaps one time being very an intricate part of this particular congregation locally, and you find yourself kind of floundering and not going in that way you should. What a great time to rededicate and get busy for the Lord. We can help you at all. We really look for that privilege as we stand and sing our song of the privilege.